Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at Chicago Public Library, welcome. We're so pleased to welcome Mickey Kendall to the stage tonight as part of our new Voices for Justice speaker series and in celebration of Women's History Month. Mickey will be in conversation with Block Club Chicago reporter Jamie Nesbitt Golden. During the program, we invite you to leave your questions, comments, and reflections in the chat. And we'll ask some questions during the Q&A at the end of the conversation. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Candace Moore, Chief Equity Officer of the City of Chicago, to introduce tonight's guests. Welcome, Candace. Hi, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm Candace Moore, and I serve as the City of Chicago's first Chief Equity Officer. And it is my pleasure to welcome tonight's guests. But first, I'd like to share a few words about an initiative that is near and dear to my heart. Together We Heal is an initiative aimed at building racial healing and transformation in Chicago. This year, we've declared 2022 our year of healing with a focus on three pillars. Reflect on our past, which includes educating and engaging about past and present racial injustices and structures of racial inequality. Reclaim our present. Uh, this includes identifying lessons learned from the past to inform new values and norms that shift power and reimagine our future. This is where we envision a more inclusive future state and design policies to produce and sustain more equitable outcomes. Uh, Chicago Public Library's Voices for Justice allows us to use the power of writing and discussion to explore all three pillars with our neighbors across Chicago. When I think about the work of tonight's author, Chicago's own Mickey Kendall, the Reclaim Our Present pillar stands out to me as she challenges us to ensure that our present movements for justice center those most marginalized and results in transformative impact in, in their lives. In her own words, a movement for, for all women must meet the needs of every woman. Mickey is a writer, diversity consultant, and occasional feminist who talks a lot about intersectionality, policing, gender, sexual assault, and other current events. Her essays can be found at Time, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Ebony, Essence, Salon, and a host of other sites. She's the author of Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists, a graphic history of, of women's fights for their rights. Her latest book, The New York Times bestselling Hood Feminism, is a recipient of the Chicago Review Book Awards and was named a Chicago Public Library Best Book of 2020. Tonight, Mickey will be interviewed by J Jamie Nesbitt Golden, an award-winning journalist who covers Bronzeville and the near South Side for Black Club Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Mickey and Jamie to the CPL virtual stage. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Candace. So, are you ready, lady? Listen, you know how this goes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is um, uh, I, the last day of Women's History Month, and what a doozy it has been. It's been a fascinating journey through <laughs> both how women make history and how we try to write, write women out of history. So, um, before we sort of segue into, you know, like the two anniversary of the release of Hood Feminism, I want to talk a little bit about what we witnessed Sunday during the Oscars. And it seems to be, uh, there seems to be a lot of opinions about what happened and a lot of finger pointing. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of finger pointing at Jada Pinkett Smith for somehow sending signals to her husband to go on stage and accost Chris Rock. What are your thoughts about that? I am going to point out that everyone involved is an adult and adults make choices, independent choices all by themselves. And that uh, given how open Jada Pinkett Smith has been about her struggle with alopecia and the fact that although people tend to associate that solely with hair loss, they can actually, because it is an autoimmune disorder, trigger a host of other health complications, plus, the context that people have sort of tossed out the window, even the frame of reference in that joke, we're going to call it a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, Demi Moore didn't exactly get a warm reception during or after filming for that hairstyle. And in the movie, which people seem to have misinterpreted the references, uh, it is used as a tool to demean and dehumanize her. 
So let's put those pieces together. And then let's talk about the fact that uh, it wasn't in the script. And all Jada Pinkett Smith was doing was sitting there waiting to see her spouse possibly, and in fact, actually win uh, a big award. Chris Rock made a choice. Will Smith made a choice. Jada Pinkett Smith is the only person in this that didn't actually make a choice. She didn't make a choice to be the butt of the joke. She didn't, as far as anyone has been able to show me, look at Will and say, get him. In fact, it looks like Oh, they she were did. gonna do the polite, like giggle she rolled her eyes. thing. She rolled her eyes and gave a pain look, and that's yeah. when. But it, right. but that didn't stop people from going to social media attacking her for sitting there. Um, we talked. You, you talked a lot about misogynoir, and I think you know a, 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 a term coined by our friend uh, Moya Bailey. Um, how does that play into a situation like this? So in this situation, I'm gonna baldly say that. If Jada Pinkett Smith had been a white woman suffering from a disease and that joke was made, we would be having a different conversation. Even if her A-list spouse had been the one to see the hope, hope the, 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 the hurt and react. So there's that. B, I'm going to say um, that for a lot of people, the idea that Jada Pinkett Smith has feelings seems to have escaped them. That when she has talked in the past, about sobbing in her shower as giant clumps of hair fell off and someone coming in to pick her up off the floor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a lot of math to figure out who someone could have been that came and saw her in her lowest, most painful moments. You make a decision when you poke at someone's illnesses and injuries, right? And we can say that it's a joke and it's comedy and whatever, but really you, you, you put it out there and people get to react. Now, I'm not condoning physical violence, but if Will Smith had started roasting Chris Rock, I feel like we'd be having a similar conversation. He just yelled what he yelled from, the, from his seat. We'd be having a similar conversation because the idea here is supposed to be that they don't react. Mm -hmm. But misogynoir makes people think Black women are strong enough to survive anything. And even if they don't survive, so what? Who cares? It's just another Black woman. Sometimes we get hurt. Sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we cry. And sometimes people who love us defend us. They may not do it in the right way. They may not go about it in the way that the rest of the world would like them to, but it happens, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it happened. Uh, people can rightfully feel that the way it happened was inappropriate, but we should also understand that sometimes uh, people respond out of emotion and their own pain and history. And when you are pushing your fingers in someone's wound, you get what you get. Everybody owes an apology and we should all just move on. Is, is, what's the African proverb, run up, get done up? I don't, I'm, I'm not like that. I don't know. I mean, it's better than the one I grew up with, which is talk, <laughs> get hit. So choices are made. True, true. Um, so awkward segue. Um, okay. February marked the second anniversary of your book release, Hood Feminism. And that release also coincided with the COVID pandemic, <laughs> um, which we are on, was it year three of this? Um, I think there was a, a news item that came out today about how the, how news stories that cover the disparities in COVID uh, vaccines uh, and treatment um, that, you know, sort of highlight race as a factor uh, actually uh, turns off readers, which is wild to me. Can you talk about that a little? Like, why is it <laughs> even the mention of race in something as, you know, urgent as a global pandemic uh, can, can make people feel a way? I, I'm going to add to this that everyone was all aboard pulling together until the numbers came out that showed initially, just initially, COVID was more harmful in communities of color than other communities. Then suddenly it was no big deal. And then know that people will say this is a very American problem. It is not just an American problem. It is a very post-colonialism, post-imperialism, post-slavery problem in that people are very uncomfortable acknowledging the history um, that has led us here, as well as the current events that keep us here, 
right? We had so few safety nets during COVID, mm -hmm. in part because for a long time, politicians have been able to talk people out of their needed safety nets by saying those people will benefit unfairly, welfare queens, things like that. Well, it turns out uh, we all sometimes need a hand, especially when the rainy day is three years long. I don't care what you had saved, you probably didn't have three years of crisis money saved. <laughs> no. And so people are uncomfortable hearing mm -hmm. reality. Like we've made of race, this is part of the critical race theory backlash and the book bans and things. Oh, yeah. We've made of race this idea that you shouldn't mention it. You shouldn't mention the history. You shouldn't mention its current impact, but we should all get over it. How do we get over it when these things are still happening and these things still have an impact? The answer is that we don't, but we keep thinking that if we shove enough things under the blanket, eventually the monster under the bed will eat them and we'll never have to deal with them. America has a problem with race. The planet has a problem with race. Globally, anti-Asian sentiments are rising. Anti-Blackness has never gone away. We just saw that in Ukraine as, a, as African students were attempting to escape. Mm -hmm. If we don't address race directly and head on, we will also not address the other things impacted by racism, ranging from healthcare to education to access to all of these things. You know, uh, as Candace just talked about this idea of a year of reconciliation. Well, reconciliation requires us to confront the harm that was done, come up with a plan on how to restore relationships, but also how to prevent it from happening again. So do you see that actually happening? Do you see us having a, a, a sort of reckoning? I think we're gonna be forced into having a reckoning with reality. I don't think that we are going about that in the best or easiest way. And there's calmer, better ways we could do this, but- <laughs> Like America likes to be dragged into things kicking and screaming and then pat itself on the back decades later for, for its progress, so. And that's really what I think we're going to see here is that America's going to sort of resist and resist and resist until it can't resist anymore. And then America's going to have to sort of step back and have a hard conversation with itself. Um, I would have thought the over a million uh, deceased people from COVID would have triggered that. You would have thought the January 6th insurrection would have triggered that. You would have thought the recent news um, that Justice Clarence Thomas's wife is apparently uh, going to need to be investigated for the money that she was donating to the people who attacked the Capitol and the Heritage Foundation and other things, her ties to them, would have triggered something. But it looks like we've come very far and we have a long way to go. Do you see any sort of, I know there have been some arrests made uh, over the J6 uh, in, insurrection, um, but it seems like justice is slow moving, right? Like, I mean, we're not, getting, <laughs> I mean, people are not, and, and maybe that's because, you know, we're used to this sort of, you know, fast food law and order type of, you know, like we got them, we get them. So like, how do you, how, how do we make sense of what's happening here? I'm going to point out that the federal system, um, is very different than your local state or uh, city courts. Just because things aren't happening fast doesn't mean things aren't happening. In fact, things are happening. I have been sort of keeping track of what is going on on the DOJ website. A, the reason it seems like so few people are being sentenced to any significant uh, prison time is that they're getting the people who are pleading guilty out of the way first. Um, and in, in federal citations, as with everything else, the federal jurisdiction, Sometimes a plea deal is better than anything you would get in front of a federal judge. So mm -hmm. a lot of people, when confronted with the evidence, and as we all know, as we watched it play out, many people stood in front of a camera and said their whole name. Uh, like they were real bold with it. You gotta, you have to love that. Like they, right? you, you know, told me your name, what you were there to do, like, where I mean, you came they, from. They were on, you know, Instagram, like snapping photos on the, like, hey, at the insurrection. Hi. Listen, <laughs> I saw someone's like Facebook or Instagram live that was like overthrowing the government. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna get a brew later. Yeah. Right. I mean, like that was, yeah. 
and you have if you read the 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 charging documents yeah you have charging documents on the federal website where they are very clearly like i can just imagine the person putting it together where they're like well, we, we look at this <laughs> and they said this and right. then they also, told the news that Shout out to the internet sleuths because they were also on it. You like, there are a very dedicated crew out there who like is sifting through every piece of social media to put names to faces, like just, you know, like moms from like, you know, Kentucky, just sort of like, okay, we're going to get these guys. And like, I mean, that gives you a little bit of hope in that, you know, people see something wrong and they want to, you know, do something to correct it. But my gosh, like... (laughs) Like it has been. <laughs> Listen, and this is one of those places where we're going to see women sort of playing a role, both for ill in terms of the ones who've been arrested, but also a lot of people involved in the federal investigations. And looks like we're going to have a brand new uh, Supreme Court, ju- court justice. Yeah, um, so about that. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, we talked about this last week, how we were avoiding the confirmation uh, hearings because um, having sat through our fair share, we were just like, we're going to give ourselves the gift of of not doing that to ourselves. Um, and sure enough, there were a lot of microaggressions, macroaggressions, casual racism, funny race. Like, I mean, a lot of reaction memes of, you know, the court, you know, Supreme Court Justice nominee. Uh, just, you know, doing her best to maintain the straight face. <laughs> listen, listen, and let me just say this. The fact that she kept a straight face when Senator Ted Cruz started holding up children's books, I want to go to her media training. <laughs> it's got to be epic. It's got to be some of the best media training. Business. Some of the best media training. Business. I mean, like, really? It's Ted Cruz. It's Ted Cruz. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to say this. Um, One thing that women, especially Black women, have to know how to do sometimes in an awkward office and other situation is manage to keep a straight face while someone who couldn't manage to stick around in the same country to do their job for their constituents. The man went to Mexico. It was like, oh, wait, am I supposed to? Vacation. I'm just going to go to, do you guys mind if I go to Cancun? Oh, are you dying? Is there a winter storm? The power is out for all of you? I don't, I'm sorry. Yeah. So like, yeah. So someone like Ted Cruz questioning your credentials after we've seen the appointment of folks who were grossly underqualified for this position. (laughs) We're being asked to sort of, you know, to to sort of deal with a lot here or or sort of just sit with a lot. Um, Are you, are you optimistic that she will secure the nomination? I do think she will secure the nomination. I think uh, Susan Collins just announced that she intends, reps have done this now, she intends, right? Um, (laughs) So they may not need to tie break. Um, Susan Collins is really our, our Lucy. Um, like that woman loves to snatch the football. <laughs> right, listen, we're going to see what happens. <laughs> we're gonna, uh, they yeah. always had the votes, technically, in, in the Senate. They always had the votes. Um, I think what's going to be really interesting is how long they try to delay the vote. Helpfully, uh, Madison Cawthorn uh, has started talking about things in politics. Yeah, that was, was there that a was rush. Fun. That was really interesting. I, you know, like uh, he he felt very comfortable in talking about things that were happening uh, with Republican, you know, uh, senior uh, officials there. Um, but do you he think is, it will come of that? Because I don't really, I don't know, like if we can touch that particular topic right now. But the broad strokes are that Cawthorn uh, mentioned that there there was some uh, unsavory uh, goings on happening uh, <laughs> among. I'm just going to say that uh, he used a term in the unsavory going on that I had never heard from anyone who didn't participate. <laughs> like, I'm just, I, like, so I, I don't know. I don't know what's <laughs> happening over there. But I feel like in the in the rush to move the news cycle along yeah, and, and drown that out now seems probably to them like a really good time to go for this. And yeah. Uh, just, yeah, listen, here, take that. Take, take that. Yeah. 
Like, let's move. Let's deflect, deflect. But no, um, so that also brings me to another thing I wanted to ask you about, because this election cycle, we heard a lot of, listen to Black women, trust Black women. Like, <laughs> like a lot of lip service paid to, uh, you know, Black women who, you know, do, you know, represent um, an oversized swath of d- Democratic voters. Like, we know this. But again, it seemed just, you know, like lip service. It seemed very much like the response to the uprisings of 2020. Like everybody, you know, was like Black Lives Matter and, you know, sort of had that in their Twitter bios. And um, what can you, like, where, what do you think we are now with the listening to Black women in in terms of democratic leadership and, and the direction we're going? And what does truly listening to Black women look like? I mean, I will believe we are listening to Black women when uh, the voices aren't just one or two, but are many at every level. Uh, I think, honestly, one way Democrats could be listening to Black women is talking to Black women who don't make as much money, who live in lower income communities, whether that be urban or rural, uh, suburban, whatever. Um, But also, at some point, We've got to stop saying, well, yeah, we know race is a problem. Yeah, we know misogyny is a problem. And start looking at what ignoring it is permitting to have, right? You have uh, the, the bill in Florida, the don't say gay bill. You have everything Texas politicians are doing. Mm-hmm. You have risks in Georgia and Virginia and whatever's happening in New York. And in each case, I could probably find you not just high profile black women who said this is a problem, but lots of them on the ground, day to day. And at some point, the conversation has to shift to, okay, this is our base. This is whose votes we are hinging everything on. We should, we should probably not count on those votes. Because let's be honest, a lot of that, that base is because the other option likes to say things like, like it's like I, I just I don't understand how the opposition party clearly I do understand let me let me take that back because we are committed to not being good people so of course like obviously it's like hey let's sign the crown act which you know stops discrimination against black hair or hey let's get all get behind the anti-lynching bill these things seem like no brainers, but when you have a party that's dedicated to erratic, you know, sort of erasing democracy, this is kind of what happens, right? Like they are- I, I would I would argue that they, they were fine with the concept of democracy, but only for some people, and that's what they're dedicated to. Um, and not all of them and yada yada, all the qualifiers people are looking for in this conversation, but there are people who are very firmly committed to preventing children from learning history. They are very firmly committed to preventing children from learning about their own bodies, their own interests in terms, not just of sexuality, but in terms of education, right? And Mm -hmm. I I understand that uh, some people will claim it's their church. And I'm gonna point out that Utah's governor uh, stood up and said, I am not signing this bill that punishes trans youth for existing because I want to make sure they survive. So, but I, and I get it. But, and, and again, I thought that he was an Aaron Sorkin creation because s- something like that, something reasonable and empathetic coming from someone who is a member of the GOP is something that is, you he know. He read the book that they're all relying on. He read the whole book. <laughs> so, um, so that, that should give us a little bit of hope that, you know, that there are people on the other side who clearly understand what's happening. Meanwhile, we do have Governor DeSantis, who, as you said, signed that bill. Um, for people who are just writing this off as, well, they're just making sure that you know you don't have inappropriate conversations with young kids. Can you talk about what really is in that bill? So that bill and dozens of others like it prevent kids. First of all, I'm going to back this up as a parent. A lot of people heard the word sex education in kindergarten through third grade and assumed that we were talking about people actually having sex. That is not actually what K through three health education looks like. It is teaching kids about their own body, good touch, bad touch, all of those things. 
and teaching them not to hate themselves for the ways that they might feel, okay? Because surprise, your sexual orientation is a spectrum and that spectrum starts really early. <laughs> Arguably, the birth, who you're attracted to or not attracted to. Um, and yes, life informs and blah, 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 but we've already seen from survivors of attempts to make people not gay that uh, that doesn't work because uh, a lot of those people end up harming themselves, first of all, but also uh, the people who don't uh, go on to tell us all that they were basically tortured. So we shouldn't be normalizing anything that leads to torture. We shouldn't be normalizing anything that leads to punishing children for asking questions, for being curious. Um, there's a lot of things I wanna say that I can't say on this podcast. We have to behave. But I mean, the FCC has we're thinking about the sex education rate we received as students of, of CPS, um, I, I don't recall talking about, you know, like, like you said, it was very much, these are your body parts. This is, this is what consent looks like. This is, you know, if someone touches you without consent, this is, this, it's okay to say no, tell a grown up. I mean, like very much that. So not, I, so how did, how did we get from that to, oh my God, they're going to, teach about people having the sex. Because just- they somehow believe that telling children that other sexual orientations exist means that those children will change their sexual orientation. Uh, the reality is that people's sexual orientation is an internal thing. It has really nothing to do with what anyone says or what they see. Because if it was about that, then everyone would probably, since we show kids heterosexual couples pretty much all the time, all the time on TV shows, cartoons, comic books, where um, then everybody would, would be straight, right? So that's not how that works. Um, but also I am convinced that many of these people really didn't look at the curriculum. The people who want to ban books, who want to say you can't mention being um, gay or lesbian or bisexual, transgender or whatever, all of these things, um, they don't really talk to their constituents. They don't talk to children. They don't talk to parents of kids who are trans or any of the other parts of this, right? When Texas are pushing their bill. Uh, full disclosure, my oldest uh, is girl is trans. And she uh, told us, and she was assigned male at birth, and we cleaned that up. She is she, and I am the kind of parent. If you say something and talk to her about her in front of me, well, I'll make what Will Smith did look look, look pleasant. Let's take my comparison. And just to be clear, she does also have a, a group of volunteers who are also bad about it. Like this, let's just be right. so like, like, yeah. Um, and, and so I, this to me is the thing. Yeah. I want my kid alive. I want my kid to have a job and be happy and have a love life and whatever. I'll be honest. I don't understand the obsession with small children's interests in the opposite sex or not the opposite sex or whatever. Because we don't want to think about it that much in this house. Um, and like, here's my thing. Many of the people who have changed history, whether we were talking about Polly Murray or Bayard Rustin or anyone else in, you know, Marsha J.P. Johnson, all of these people who've made it possible for rights mm-hmm. to happen. The women, many of the women in the labor movement in Chicago were not straight. Many of the men were not straight. People who planned the, the civil rights marches and all of these things, many of them were, were not heterosexual. They changed the world. They gave us the rights that we enjoy today. And we are absolutely dishonoring them and their sacrifices when we decide that we don't like orientation. Because many of the people involved in the same kind of immigration fights that allow us to have all of these folks in this country and made America the melting pot, as we call it. They weren't straight either. He was an 11. <laughs> He's so bad. You're just bad. <laughs> I'm the sweet, innocent one in this conversation. I am. Ooh, lie again. Anyway, um, so right. another awkward segue. Mm-hmm. Your first book, before you dropped Hood Feminism, was... And I am blanking on the name, even though we have Amazon's had- abolitionist and activist is right behind my head. I don't know. <laughs> <what you're doing. laughs> oh. And we also had a number of conversations about that. So, I, like, so I remember you spending like 
months sort of researching for this project. Um, and the, the, the finished pro product is nothing short of amazing. Um, but it's really funny that this is also a book that might be in danger of getting banned one day. But like you said, Hood Feminism is on the banned book list, but not this book, this graphic <laughs> novel. They can't figure out. They, they it's a graphic no. book. Yeah. So like, um, talk to me about the, a little, about the, the process of, of, you know, sort of putting together, you know, this chronicle of amazing uh, women and femmes throughout, throughout history. So one of the things about this is that when I pitched uh, Amazon's abolitionist and activists, I wanted to talk about women's history and women's fight for their rights, but I didn't want to focus in on just the suffrage movement or just one country. I wanted to talk about how it happens all over the world because we didn't get here in 40 years or 100 years. We actually have a lot of periods in human history where equality and parity was working and then misogyny or misogyny noir came in and then everything ever could be burned down. Because um, it turns out this is not a model that ends well for civilizations, just for the record. And so during the process, I decided to go back to 4000 uh, BC and see where early women's rights may have come from. But also um, I had seen this thing that talked about the cave paintings and the early art that we had always thought of being made by men. I was taught it was made by craftsmen. Yeah, all of it was made by women. Those women were all effectively erased from their own creations because we couldn't imagine a reality where women had been foundational to humanity, even though that seems like an obvious thing. Um, so everything from the first calendar, which measures out 28 days, and if you have a period, you know what that's about, um, to where there were not the statues, the early statues that we would find, the bodies, were seemingly overly fertile, right? Very bulbous, all of these things. Never had a face. Yeah, that's because they were the work of someone looking down at themselves, huh. not as someone looking at another person. Perspective makes complete sense if you look. At it. <laughs> um, and so when you start to realize how easily women were being raised, you kind of go through history and you see all of these women you never learned about in school. Right? You learn all of these historical details about this king or that king, but it's a lot of queens. There are many queens who restyled the sheep wolves. There are many medical advancements, all of these things, math, science. Uh, one of the first uh, astrological or astronomy towers was built in what is now Korea by a woman who was the ruler at the time, right? And so you, and it's still standing, it's still, doing, it's still standing, it's still there. Uh, and so when you start to get into what was being designed, what was being built, what has sustained through the ages, and the fact that they were routinely erased, um, sometimes by having their statues destroyed and their names stripped off obelisks or other things, sometimes by us just not being taught about them. Or let's say they wrote a paper and their spouse, um, looking at the Fitzgeralds here, uh, they wrote things and their spouse had them committed and stolen work. And we don't necessarily realize that many of the things we give credit for to a man um, and to a straight white man at that may have come from someone who was a, not a man, uh, whether they were a cisgender woman or a non-binary queer, whatever, and B, uh, they weren't white. And so when you start to kind of delve into that history, you start to kind of put the pieces together and go, we, not that, before someone sends an angry email, not that white men never invent anything, but invention, like everything else, is a collaborative work. Mm -hmm. People build on and improve through the ages. We get here together. And so the process of that book really highlighted to me that so much of the way we teach history is creating a problem um, societally and or it's, a, it's a, a which came first, chicken or egg, right? Either we're creating the problem and passing it down or this is how we got here. You decide which way you want to shape that. But we tell girls and boys, right? And people who will not yet have known their gender um, that men do this, women do that. First of all, gender isn't binary. So this is our first problem. But then second of all, we tell them that women contribute less, brown people contribute less, black people contribute less, all of these things. And then we say, well, why are they bigoted? 
we just chopped them to bit. So part of the goal of the book was to reintroduce all of these people. And then the way that we teach history is really boring. So you don't learn about a lot of this stuff in right. K through 12. You learn right. about it in college. And you only learn about it in college if you take more than that first couple of history classes. Right. right? Well, if we introduce these things in K through 12, people might want to learn more history. We might be able to teach a more comprehensive version of history. We might not have to repeat um, and then unteach things that we are taught uh, in K through 12, right? Like George Washington's teeth. I remember being taught that George Washington's teeth were made of wood and metal. Same, same. George Washington's teeth were made um, of the hold without their consent, teeth of enslaved people and formed into dentures for him. And that is a stupid lie to tell in the first place, but it is a persistent one and it's almost impossible to unteach. And when you are talking about it, you will have people in history you must be wrong. I have this a lot with this book. A lot of people read this book and then decide that they were gonna to try to debunk me. Um, so what is, what is, yeah, what is the craziest response you've received to, to some of the things you, you or some of the people you've spoken oh, to? Um, <laughs> One of the things that was super interesting was realizing how many people had no idea that uh, pre-Florence Nightingale S, there were other women also making sure people didn't die of disease. But more importantly, that for generations, uh, sanitation uh, was largely the work of women. And that if you were having babies delivered by a male doctor, your chances of survival were very low. Um, and so, I had people saying, well, why did you focus on these women specifically who, you know, looked at sanitation, did all of these things? Why, why, why all of this? And it's like, because without soap and water, we don't survive. Without using vinegar to wash things, boiling water to sterilize things, we don't survive. Um, and one of the things that was most interesting to me in that process was a number of people who were trying to like challenge me, who then would go to look things up to argue with me and then come back and be like, so I didn't ever learn this. No one ever taught me any of this. When, where did you learn this? And then we talk about, right? And I, I'm not mad at them. Please don't think I'm mad at them because I know that they gave me learned it. Yeah. Wow. That is, that is something. And so what, like when you talk to, to, to teens or you know, young adults about what they've read, like what are some of the things they tell you upon reading this? Like, so one of the things is that many of them didn't realize how much children had done in history, right? We really don't talk about children's role in the Crusades and children's roles in rebellions or- like Just largely ignored or like, um, like uh, yeah. So right. why is And so finding out the ages of some of the people, I think for a lot of kids was like, oh, <clears throat> wait, I, I don't have to wait to, to open my mouth. I, I don't- I can say something now because we tend to tell children, some of us grew up with this, that children are meant to be seen and not heard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sometimes your kids know more than you do. Sometimes your kids are way more tapped into what's going on at school and their world, whatever. Yeah. And it's very easy sometimes to slip up. And I'm, I'm going to use this concept of reconciliation because that's what this opens with. To slip up and think the kids aren't paying attention. But in Chicago in particular, Kids experience a lot of violence. Kids experience a lot of hunger and poverty and subpar housing and all of these things. And part of you know, a theoretical reconciliation would be talking about conditions the children of Chicago are living with. Not just in terms of recently with COVID and the walkouts for mask mandates, or even you know, the variety of strikes that have had to occur or whatever but also in terms of what it means to have a cop in your school, what it means to not have a librarian in your school, but to have an officer, for example, mm -hmm. to not have a nurse, to not have all of the things that your school needs to go through. Um, let's take it out of schools for a second, because everybody is like, I'm just picking on schools, um, to go through dealing with problems with CTA, getting back and forth to school, um, you know, 
if you are living in Chicago public housing or on a section eight voucher or any of that, you go through there. But also on the same note, I've had conversations with kids who because of what's happening in other states, they've begun to say, okay, it's not perfect, but at least it's not, right? And I think we could do better than at least it's not. Like I love Chicago, I love Illinois. I think that there are things that we could be doing mm -hmm. to make this place as thriving and gorgeous and healthy as we would imagine it to be for everyone. I, I always say that Chicago seems to have an identity, identity crisis in that like it believes that it's progressive, but it really isn't as progressive as it thinks it is. And that, you know, we are still having some of the same issues that we've had um, for generations now. And that's due to disinvestment and that's due to racism. Um, and, you know, things can't easily be fixed even when you have someone who looks like you in one of the highest offices in the in the city. Can you talk about a, a, a little about, you know, like, because we hear this term all the time, identity politics and, and you know, how we shouldn't uh, really latch on to identity when, you know, sort of fighting for our rights. Can you talk about how, you know, is this a good thing, a bad thing? Like, what are we getting wrong about identity, identity politics in particular? I mean, I think one of the things that people have sort of forgotten here is that identity politics are always here. It's, I'm just gonna say this broadly, Chicago is a city that had one of the biggest race riots in American history over oh, identity okay. politics, okay? So when you are thinking about what it means to vote for someone, to have someone in office, how the person stays in office, whatever, you have to realize that looking like you is not enough, but neither is it really a dismissive thing because sometimes all of the candidates on offer are not particularly great. I'm just gonna say that. Um, Chicago is, is in a state that has sent seven governors to jail. So, and, and on both sides of the aisle, this is not a Republican versus Democrat. We just try right. to see things it's going through. So there is that. Then there is the fact that um, when we are looking at Chicago, I'm going to bring up the Chicago Renaissance here. And, you know, you don't talk about as much as Chicago Renaissance, but we had one, was on books, you should look around, all of that. Um, what you're looking at is a city that has had great artists, had great writers, had has birthed amazing people. Um, but we don't know what we're doing with that all the time. And sometimes, we have to pull together again as a team uh, across the aisles um, to put the city first and to put the people in the city first over, let's say, our pockets or our egos. That's a very diplomatic answer. But well done. I'm proud of you. Like usually, like you know, when we talk, you know, it's it's a it's a little more colorful when we when we talk about this. I am, I am professional. I am a professional. You are. You are. You are killing it today, sis. You are. Yes, yes, love it. Yes, um, I, I think we're coming coming close to the uh, end of the conversation here. Uh, is there? A, I think the Q and A session is about to begin. Uh, so, oh, hey, Jennifer. Indeed, yes. Thanks, guys. We have some great questions that have come in uh, in the chat and through email. So we'll get through as many as we can. Um, the first one is, what are your thoughts on the pending bills to prohibit discrimination based on hairstyle and or texture? I think that they're long overdue. I think that there are going to be people who are saying, we don't need that. And I'm going to tell you that um, the it will bring the rest of the country into line with federal government standards for their employees. That's all it's doing. You cannot, and I used to be a federal employee, you cannot discriminate based on hair texture uh, against federal employees in promotion, hiring, anything. Even bringing that kind of thing up is a good way to go along with having a position. And I think that a lot of jobs camouflage bigotry in their dress codes around hair. Um, there's not a particular reason that locks like mine should be banned at a job. Yes, if I work with food, I should put them up, put them back, right? But that's a ponytail. Um, there's not a reason that an Afro is considered less professional, whatever. If the way your hair grows out of your head is somehow a reason for people to discriminate against you, then America needs to do something about it. That's my thought. Thank you. 
Um, Mickey, you say in your bio that you're an occasional feminist. What do you mean by that? I mean that sometimes feminism is just not getting it done. Um, and for I struggle with identifying as a feminist. I have thought about womanism. I have thought about a lot of things people bring up, being a Black feminist, all of this. And at base, I want feminism to do better. But there are days like anyone else, um, and I'm going to talk about what happened Sunday and the reactions afterward um, from a lot of theoretically feminist white women on the internet, where I was like, you know what, maybe I'm just going to give feminism back to y'all for a minute because I don't want to be associated with what you're doing. Sometimes things are not about us. And we do not have to center ourselves in a discussion between people we don't know. It's just that. That's great. Do you, this kind of segues into the next question. Um, somebody asked, do you think that social media has improved things because people can make connections in community or has it been just another way to generate more hate? I think it's both. And that's not me equivocating. It is just that there are two sort of separate paths you can choose on your social media at various points, right? So you have people who join groups that center around hate and you can use the internet to make groups that center around hate whether that is being um, transphobic or racist or whatever, pick your, pick your thing. And then you have people who build groups that are centered around shared interests, building a community that wants to tackle a problem, et cetera. And so the internet makes great when you use it to do good, but like any other tool, you could use it to do harm. And I think social media is one of those really double-edged swords where you are choosing every day the path that you're going to go down. And I know people will talk about recruitment and other things that happen in forums, and this is true, but also people are choosing those forums because the hate feels more comfortable to them than doing the work of healing. Um, that kind of goes along with the next question too is, uh, Lindsay says, I've recently been exploring the black digital humanities and came across your hashtag solidarity is for white women. Have you found a good way to engage with white feminists in the digital space? Uh, yes and no. I know this sounds like I'm equivocating again. I'm not. There are some people who I had negative interactions with around the hashtag back in 2013 who have reassessed and reframed and are willing to do their internal work so we can have a real conversation. Doesn't mean we 100% agree with each other at this point, but they've stopped knee jerking uh, about the idea that there's no racism in feminism so we can have an honest conversation. Then there are other people who are deeply offended. I dared suggest uh, that feminism was imperfect. Um, and they're going to be offended uh, for a very long time. But also, I looked at the way that they move in other places, and I am okay with us not getting along. In fact, one of the greatest joys in life is knowing that people will never associate me with someone who talks like that about other human beings. And I think there is a space in this to talk now a little bit about people who are trans exclusionary. They call themselves radical things, and that is a real identity, but it is not the same as the thing I'm talking about. Um, they are often also super racist. And I now realize as time has passed, that many of the white feminist voices that I really was getting into conflicts with, yeah, they had a couple issues with thinking other people were human and deserved to exist. So they call themselves feminists though. Uh, someone else is asking, what are your thoughts about the abolition of police and prisons as it relates to many of these topics? I am, full disclosure, I'm not an abolitionist, I am a reductionist. I think we have too many cops um, doing a lot of nothing. And I'm gonna to point to Chicago's crime solving stats for that purpose. Um, there are very few crimes that I think people should go to jail for. There are lots of times I think people should be removed from society for a much shorter period of time than our sentencing to get therapy, to go through rehab, to do the things that would make their lives better. And I also think that once you've done that, you shouldn't be prevented from having a job and a bunch of other things. Um, but I think overwhelmingly, Chicago has a lot of cops. Chicago's violence rates aren't going down meaningfully. And uh, we spend a lot of money on Chicago police, not just directly, but indirectly in lawsuits. And I think the case solve rate for homicide is still under 25%. We're not getting safer by giving more money to police officers. And I know someone's gonna get upset about that. I'm gonna redirect them to those stats. More than 50 black women have been found murdered in the city of Chicago over the last 20 years. 
We don't actually know how many have were actually killed because for decades, the police ignored those groups. And now we sit here talking about giving cops more money to do what? Cops are a source of violence for our kids too. Um, this goes back to the earlier part of the conversation. At a time when we see democracy is under attack, both here and abroad, where can we start to defend it? Um, right here in America. Um, if, if you live somewhere else where you are too, I know people will say voting isn't enough and voting isn't enough. You gotta run for office. You gotta put your foot on a politician's proverbial neck about doing the right thing. Um, but also push, you know, not just at the presidential election, midterms are important. Your local elections are important. Often, unfortunately, people get hung up on the idea that if we win the presidential election, everything will be fixed. Fighting for democracy looks like fighting for it at the school board level. It looks like fighting for it in terms of like the water commissioner, who is uh, doing budgeting decisions in a ward or a precinct or whatever, running for city council, running for treasurer, um, because a lot of those positions make decisions that are really opaque to us. We don't really know what's going on, right? One of Chicago's issues is that we have an appointed school board, not an elected school board. Possibly an elected school board would be a good place to start, right? Um, but we have things like local school council. If you're gonna be involved and you can't or don't want to go to every city meeting, maybe getting involved in your local school council or whatever, because that's part of it. You can't hope that someone else will be your voice. You have to be your own voice. Um. You talk a lot about, in, in your books, you talk about a lot about the women who were erased from history. And uh, someone is asking in your own research for writing your books or just in general, is there one particular person who you learned about who you were yourself surprised to learn about that you think everyone should know? Hold on, because I'm gonna mess up her name unless I'm looking at it. <laughs> that is not a thing for you that, that's a, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying. I mess up her name. I know this about myself. Um, I can only do it when I'm reading it and you can laugh at me about that. Um, so hold on. Yes. Um, so, and her name is Irene, but I always want to make her name something else. But so it was Queen Irene of the Byzantine Empire, who I had no idea existed. And she was, for no particular reason, deposed. I wish I could tell you there was a good logical reason for her to be deposed, but Rome, the Roman Empire starts to fall right? And what we now think of the Byzantine Empire as the East, blah, blah, blah. Well, so Rome falls, but not all of Rome falls. She holds her portion together. Uh, she is deposed because the Holy uh, Roman Emperor doesn't recognize her as Hope as valid because she's a woman. So she's deposed, she's replaced by uh, King Nicephorus I, who proceeds to go on to fight a battle that she told him he couldn't win. She was very clear that they were, didn't have the troops, they didn't have people, too much of that. His skull ended up a drinking cup of the enemy that she told him they couldn't defeat. So that was my surprise from the ancient history. Uh, more recently in terms of modern history, um, I've been working on a thing about Polly Murray and although I knew about her, I was surprised to find out how many people had no idea who she was. And I am, also realizing that because we don't talk about the women of the civil rights movement and beyond, um, people don't realize that a lot of people involved in the suffragette movement were involved in the anti-slavery movement, were involved then tangentially in the subsequent civil rights movement. You know, there are these long lifespans of people doing this work. Well, and many of those people can be read about in your books as well, <laughs> which can be checked out at your local library. Um, we got a couple more questions, and these are both sort of book related. Um, with all the recent censorship and book banning across the country, as a writer, how does that affect your writing? And how does that affect sort of how your mental processes and your own feelings about how that could happen to you? Um, this is where the Chicago jumps out. It's outside itself. Um, I decided a long time ago that if I was going to get banned, I was going to get banned for writing what I wanted to write. But in fact, looks like I'm on that list. It's okay. I'll be okay. Uh, I was on that list in Texas. Uh, Chicago taught me to go around when I can't go through. 
to go over, to go under. And my process at this point is that now I want to write for all ages, just to make sure that while you're banning one, the other one is coming in the door and you didn't see it coming. And the reason for that is that I am tired of people trying to write reality out of our world. Um, whether that has historic reality or current events, I feel like we, we do children a disservice when we, under the guise of protecting them, um, prevent them from learning about the world that they're going into. So my process has been to take on a bunch more stuff. Those, those of you who know me offline are like, and uh, to be far more public in uh, speaking up about historical events. And I know that sometimes if you see me on Twitter, the thread will seem very simple. And it's not really written for adults. It's written for the kids who hang out on Twitter. And I'm going to do more TikTok about this, more TikToks about this kind of stuff. Because fundamentally, uh, if you can't come through the front door, that's what the back door and the windows are for. That's great. Um, so this question is for both of you. What are some books that you've read recently that you would recommend? I'll let the lady go first. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Hold on. I got it here. This or I guess the perennial read. favorites too. Right? Like, um, oh, so, well, are you, you have it already? Okay. Birthing Black Mothers, um, which is a difficult read, uh, not because it's poorly written, but because it is jam-packed with facts. It's a very small book to be as impactful as it is. Um, I've been, re <laughs> been reading junk. I regret nothing about the fact that I, like every other library kid, uh, will read whatever book falls into my hands. Uh, so everything from Scooby-Doo uh, to, uh, what was the name of that? Sorry, Jamie, you answer. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. <laughs> So I just uh, finished uh, Double Time. Uh, it's written by Dan Charnas, and it's about the legendary producer uh, Jay Dilla. Um, I was a I'm a hip hop head, so uh, this book was a really fascinating read, and I highly recommend it. Um, it talks about uh, Dilla's humble beginnings um, and his work, and you know all your favorite songs uh, from from the uh, '90s and early aughts were probably produced by this man. So. It's definitely worth the read. Um, and then the book that's coming out that I have the uncorrected proof for, that I just realized where it was closest to me, called Soul Culture, Black Poets, Books, and Questions That Grew Me Up by Rebecca Bingham Rishon. It's really good. And all of these, again, available at your Chicago Public Library branch. So we have time for just one last question, which is what is next? What are you working on now um, for both of you? So. <laughs> Jamie, tell us what's going on with Black Club and what else you're working on. Um, well, uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, so uh, we are starting, uh, or we launched a TV show called On the Block, uh, which will be premiering on WCIU Channel 26 um, the, uh, in April. I believe the first week of April, which is Thursday, or well, air on Thursdays. Um, and um, outside of that, um, yeah, no, I think that's it for me. Uh, we have that, which is a big, big thing. I'm super excited about it. Um, I am working on a comic about Polly Murray uh, that will hopefully be coming out in the New York public school system. Um, I am working on my next book, which is, uh, this is a weird thing, but go with me for a second, America. Uh, <laughs> it is about, both about my family history and the history of America. Um, because my family came from a lot of places to Chicago. Um, and one of the things was the discovery that we came to Chicago because of the destruction of small black towns uh, during Jim Crow and sort of a look at the generational impact of Jim Crow on my family, but also other families. Because as we all know, although Jim Crow primarily focused um, on black people, other communities were also impacted and lost things. And then of course we have things like Japanese internment um, and all of these things kind of coming together to create America as we know it. Spoiler alert, the feeling you may have that your parents had so much more money or your grandparents had so much more money, you don't understand why you don't have as much as you think you should. Blame Jim Crow for difference in your income disparity. And of course we will have you 
back to the library to talk about that book when it comes out as well. <laughs> so that's all the time we have for tonight, but I want to thank so much Mickey and Jamie for a wonderful discussion tonight. Thanks also to Candace Moore for her support of our Voices for Justice series at CPL, and thanks also to our CPL techs and staff working tonight. Tonight's event is possible because of the generous support of the Chicago Public Library Foundation. To learn more about their work or get involved, you can visit cplfoundation.org. Don't forget to visit Block Club Chicago to read more of Jamie's reporting, and be sure to visit your local Chicago Public Library branch to check out Mickey's books, Good Feminism and Amazon Abolitionists and Activists. Tonight's event will be available for on-demand viewing on the CPL YouTube and Facebook channels immediately following, so please tell a friend who missed it. And visit shypublive.org for information on many more upcoming events. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night.